Our scripture this, past, this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 18. Listen, hear, and receive God's word for us. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the major theological themes in the first 11 chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans proclaim that through Christ, God brings people of Jewish and Gentile descent together. And this binding together of people who are thought to be different is the practical theme that is found in chapter 12. In other words, Paul demonstrates that belief and behavior are not separate human activities, but that which we believe and how we act are inextricably interwoven. One commentator goes so far as to say that, we, that what we believe and how we act are the breath and blood of Christian living, the twin signs of life. In the opening verses of chapter 12, Paul exhorts the followers of Christ who, res, who are residing in Rome. I appeal to you, therefore, siblings, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophesy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence. The compassionate in cheerfulness. The opening verses in Romans chapter 12 is the first time that Paul uses the analogy that followers of Christ are one body with many members. Each member has a function and a role to play. We belong to one another for the mutual benefit of the whole. Paul explains that our gifts differ according to God's grace and that every gift is as important as the other. No gift is more significant than another. Each is integral to the body and one cannot function without the other. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, Paul continues, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think are less honorable, we clothe with great honor. God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior members that they may be no that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. In other words, each of us is an essential and integral part of the whole. Don't try living a Christian life alone. 
We were created to live in community. We were created to mutually support, honor, love, and respect one another, and to think more of others than we do of ourselves. Some of us may take exception to some of Paul's other writings. He did not always get it right concerning some subject matters. I think we can agree on that. But he was a man of his day and his culture. However, I pray that we agree that what Paul writes next in this chapter is an imperative and non-negotiable if we are to live peaceably together as God's people. Every one of us, regardless of our sexual orientation, gender identity, race or ethnicity, age, heritage, educational attainment, where we came from, where we're going, or the size of our bank accounts are to love one another genuinely. The siblings we like, as well as and maybe especially those we don't understand or dislike. We are to hate or abhor evil, to stand for what is honorable, righteous, and just inside as well as outside the church. And standing for what is right does not stop at the inside doors of the church. Just in case you haven't heard, there's a crucial and consequential election in just a few short weeks. And I will not tell you whom you should vote for, as that is between God and your conscience. But I will exercise my pastoral privilege to implore you that it is your and our civil and moral duty to vote. Too many people have marched. Too many people have marched, been beaten, and laid down their lives that some of us, women and people of color in particular, would have the right to cast a ballot to determine the leadership of this country. And regardless of who wins or loses, you have no right to complain about the outcome if you do not cast a ballot. Now back to Paul, <laughs> who exhorts us to hold fast or bind ourselves or stick like glue to everything that is good. Love one another with mutual or familial affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Think more of others than we do of ourselves. Do not lag in zeal or diligence. Always be ready. Be just like hot water, not lukewarm, because God will spew you out of God's mouth when you are neither hot nor cold. Amen? John writes that in the book of Revelation. And Paul encourages us to be ardent, passionate, devoted, and dedicated in serving the Lord. These are the true marks and indicators of faithful followers of Christ. And when we encounter obstacles, and beloved, those obstacles will come, for this is the reality of living in this world. We are to rejoice in hope, faith, and trust in God. Because siblings, in the words of the hymnist, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. One commentator writes, the circumstances of the believer may not warrant rejoicing. The contrary may be true. But if we see the future and in hope project ourselves into other circumstances, we know that Christ is with us. When in Christ Jesus we recognize that this is not all there is, we recognize that we inhabit a liminal space of already and not yet. We recognize the hope of the, is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. One commentator shared the story of attending a church service where members were reciting their favorite Bible verses. And one man stood up and said that his favorite verse was, it shall come to pass. Everyone looked a little puzzled. And then the pastor stood up and asked, how can that be your favorite Bible verse? To which the man replied, when I have troubles and problems, I like to read that verse and they'll know that my trouble or my problem has come to pass. It hasn't come to stay. 
The psalmist said it a little bit like this. Weeping may endure for a night. Hallelujah. But joy comes in the morning. Is that anybody else's favorite Bible verse? Amen. Anyone who may have experienced times of trouble, times of need or want, times of being excluded, demonized, preyed upon, ostracized, or marginalized, we know that God does indeed turn circumstances, situations, and separations around. We know that these things come to pass. Y'all a little quiet. Because if I was in the Baptist church right now, the saints of God would be shouting amen and hallelujah. Amen. Because <laughs> some of us know something about enduring the pain of homophobia and transphobia. Amen. Some of us know the pain of enduring racism and disenfranchisement and gender discrimination. Amen. Some of us have experienced social, financial, housing, and legal injustice and xenophobia in the world, and yes, even inside of the church. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, for God's grace and mercy and for God's justice and reconciliation, where would we be? Paul implores, implores us to be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and extend hospitality to strangers. We are not in this thing called life alone. We are dependent on one another and on God's grace, God's mercy, guidance, and love to see us through. Because in the vernacular of the world, a life be life in sometimes. And those, for those of you who need a translation, that means implicit and explicit obstacles will show up <laughs> or be thrown in our path. Paul makes it plain that this life will not always be easy. And we will need to respond and react to the side trips, the difficulties, hurdles, and stumbling blocks that will come by remaining steadfast, blessing those who persecute us, and trusting in God to see us through. Paul says, do not try living in Christ alone. In harmony with, live in harmony with one another. And if you have anything against someone, go to them. Have a discussion with them and work it out in Christian love. Do not be haughty, inaccessible, unapproachable, or distant, but associate with the lowly. And do not claim to be wiser than we are. If Jesus, being in the form of God, emptied himself and took on the form of a servant, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, who do we think that we are and that we are better than above others or can look down on anyone or are or, or wise in our own strength? The Reverend Susan Crowell writes that God is reshaping and restructuring our lives around God's grace and love so that we can reshape and restructure the world around God's grace and love. God is transforming us for the sake of the world. It is up to us, people of faith, to enable the world to see and understand the value of every human being. God loves, honors, values, and celebrates all of humanity. This includes, she continues, marginalized populations, the mentally ill, immigrants, the LGBTQIA plus community, the poor, the hungry, the homeless. This includes, she says, people of other faiths, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists. God loves, honors, values, and celebrates all of humanity. And she con concludes, our calling is to help the world see the value in every human being and to strive for peace and justice for every human being around the globe, end of quote. On this full inclusion Sunday, and again, I must clue you in, every Sunday is full inclusion at East Liberty Presbyterian Church. And as Christians are in the life of Christians, every day should be a day of full inclusion. Amen? 
We are not in the business of excluding anyone whom God created and calls good. May we realize that we were created to live in mutuality. And in the book of Romans, it says we are to live unconditional, pure, genuine, and exhibit God-like love in our relationships with one another to help others because that helps us and helps them experience more of God's grace, mercy, goodness, and love. Beloved, don't try this alone because in Christ Jesus there is no Greek or Jew, no male and female, no rich or poor, no citizen or undocumented. We are all in this together. We are all created in God's image and God loves each and every one of us the same. May it be so. And I declare in the name of Jesus that it is so. Amen.